Well, the big welcome. It's a new week, and guess who's with us? Yay! <laughs> Finally, it's five a day, and we are going to stand firm. We're still, believe it or not, in Psalm 91. We are going to look up. We're going to reach out. We're going to give thanks, and we are going to make a difference. I've lost my email from Sue Trudinger, which I want to read. Here it is. This is about reaching out and making a difference, and we'll start with this one. Welcome back, by the way, everybody. We missed you. Where have you been? You've been Father's day haven't you? Hope it went well. Anyway, he, Sue Trudinger wrote to me on Father's Day. Thank you, Sue. I had the most amazing day yesterday, which just underlines the emphasis about reaching out, making a difference, being available. In the past, says Sue, as I walk, I've always been going somewhere but now I walk with my eyes open. Sue, so, health and safety, we're all supposed to walk with our eyes open. Just want to make that point, okay? So really, <laughs> it could explain a lot. Yesterday, Tim and Solomon were constructing a fence at the back of my property. I was back and forth with food and refreshments and I kept bumping into neighbours. Could be because your eyes weren't open, Sue. Sorry, I'm being silly. I kept bumping into neighbours, two especially. Both are well known to me, but I usually only greet them and continue onwards. One is a young man who lost his wife very tragically and has recently lost his dog. Wanting to chat, be vulnerable. It was very special for me. I've always known his situation, but never had the opening to chat. The other conversation was with a mum who was opening up about a daughter who is on drugs and the difficulty this is causing in the home as she has two sisters, one of whom is training to be a doctor. That polarisation again, it's a, a theme that we've picked up during COVID, isn't it? I listened to the pain being expressed and understood so well and said, I would pray for the family. I was so humbled really, that just because I was out in the street, in the sunshine, walking, that both were able to be so vulnerable. Thank you for all the challenges you've given us to be available at this time of uncertainty. Folks, that is reaching out so simple, the tiniest of moments, easily overlooked, but turned into a chat and a prayer that had meaning and made a difference. Now many of you emailed or commented on Facebook about Dave Richards' interview last week on Black Lives Matter and I wanted to pick up a couple of things if I may before we then move on to looking up and Jill's going to help us with our prayer focus today praying for leaders in the nations that represent you as viewers. But Derek Austin sent an email in on the day of Dave Richards' Black Lives Matter interview and you'll remember the scripture that we then picked up as our resource for the day Ephesians 4 and Derek says this morning's verse of the day on the Bible app U version Ephesians 4 verse 2 and here it is again we quoted it on the interview with Dave be completely humble and gentle be patient bearing with one another in love make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Whether you are wanting to protest and join the Black Lives Matters march or adamantly opposed to it, not because of racism, but because of what it stands for and because of the COVID restrictions that are being broken. Either way, be patient, humble, gentle, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And on the Holy Trinity Brompton online service today, it was a wonderful interview with a godly uh, guy who'd been in the UK armed services, paratrooper in fact, for 17 years and now runs a thriving cyber security firm. And during the interview, I made a few notes because I thought these were worthy. These are looking up and reflecting words. These are standing firm words. The counter to racism he said, is love. And the active steps are to repair and heal. And his point was, wherever you lead, whether you lead as a mum in the home, whether you lead in a small office or in an NHS ward <clears throat> or in a retail setting, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement and the George Floyd repercussions, determine what is right 
for your world and be prepared to stand up and take active steps to repair and heal and make a stand. And he talked about the silent majority who say, I do no harm. He said, let's become those who say, not I do no harm, which is passive, but I actively do good. And he made the point, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. If you find that really stimulating, interesting, touching, impacting, then it was the Holy Trinity Brompton live service, 9.30 live service today, Father's Day Sunday, which is when we're recording this for your Monday broadcast. Well worth a watch. I'll put it on the resource panel in the YouTube content section just below this video frame. Now we're going to look up together and we're going to pray together. I want to encourage you, if you can, why don't you stand up? We can't, obviously, because we're recording. But why don't you stand up and engage with us? Let's make this a moment of prayer, both for COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement, yes, but all the polarization that that's bringing whilst we all want to see an end to injustice and racism. Difficult times made doubly difficult. Let's pray together and let's pray for wisdom as Jill leads us now for the leaders of the countries that we'll go through on our list. We're going to pray for President Trump, Mayor Blasio and all the state governors, for President Trudeau and his cabinet, for Boris Johnson and for Matt Hancock and other ministers, for President Macron, for Chancellor Merkel, for Prime Minister Sanchez, for Prime Minister Conte, for Prime Minister Scott Morrison, for Prime Minister... <laughs> Jacinda Hearn, it is. It's a mouthful when Jacinda it's written. Jacinda Hearn, Stefan Lovson and President Bolsonaro. And for President Bolsonaro and the others, Lord, we want to lift these leaders all to you. Lord, nothing is too big for you in these countries with these leaders. Nothing is too big. Lord, I pray for wisdom, wisdom from above from the, for these um, leaders of our countries. Lord, these are designated leaders that have been elected or have been brought into power. Lord, we just want to respect them, but also to ask for you to speak through them. Lord, we pray for wisdom with the issues um, raised by the Black Lives Matter, but for all multicultural issues. Lord, we ask for your wisdom for these people. Lord, and where COVID still exists in various different stages, and particularly for Bolsonaro, uh, the Prime Minister of Brazil, Lord, we ask that you would break through there, that you would give wisdom in how to deal with the unlocking or the locking up um, of COVID cases. Lord, so people can, people's lives can be protected. Lord, these are big issues, Black Lives Matter and COVID um, internationally. Lord, in some countries it's waning, but in others like Brazil, it seems like a, like a plague of unprecedented proportions. And we just ask, Lord, that you would intervene in this plague, that you would save lives, that you would cause the medical researchers to do really well with their research into um, if you've had it, how long do you get immunity for, but also research into the um, different centres that are trialling drugs right now and for others that are still developing drugs and for AstraZeneca who are now producing millions of vaccines. Lord, we just pray for wisdom and for productivity and insight for them. Pray that it would go really, really well for them. That's what we're asking you for, that you would have your hands on these leaders and these countries in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now we're about to go into an interview with a good friend of mine, Ben Rook. But before we do, we must stand firm. And we're still in Psalm 91. And I find this psalm, of course, is the one that you, between you, voted as the top scripture during COVID and lockdown easing. But I find it doubly helpful during this mix, this bewildering mix that Tony Gray shared with us last week of COVID and now Black Lives Matters. And 
verse 14. You remember last week we finished up the week treading down the lion and the cobra, trampling the great lion and the serpent. And it goes on to say in verse 14, four things we trample down, by the way. We're about to get four answers to prayer, including the prayer we've just engaged in together, praying for wisdom for our leaders. And verse 14 of Psalm 91 says, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. We need rescuing, don't we, from racism. We need rescuing from different attitudes and approaches to lockdown easing. Some parents fearful to send their kids to school. Other parents so frustrated that schools are taking so long. Schools we just had in our backyard, in our garden just now, Carleen, my eldest daughter, reading out a letter from her school. Over 600 new directives from the government in this past week alone. They need rescuing too. Mm -hmm. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. Let's pray for rescue. Mm -hmm. Rescue from racism. Rescue from violence. Rescue from the dark forces that are working in legitimate protests. Rescue us, we pray, in your mercy. Now we're going to cut to the interview with Ben Rook. It's part one of a two-part interview. I want you to look out particularly for the word bivocational and co-vocational. I think Ben's got something. Ben is senior leader of REACH, one church in multi-locations, Derby, Belper, Leicester and Nottingham. And he's also on the Sphere team of Synergy. It's one of the Salt and Light family spheres. Let's go to that interview. Well, it's a huge welcome to Ben Rook, senior leader of REACH, one church in multiple locations. You said Ben, Derby, Belper, Leicester and Nottingham and also on the Synergy Sphere team. That's quite a mouthful, isn't it, to say. <laughs> ben, I know uh, off camera you showed me a book. I'll get you to talk about that in just a moment. But just tell us briefly about your family and how COVID's gone for you. Here we are towards the end of June, starting to ease lockdown. How's it all gone? Yeah, well, um, thanks. Yeah, so I'm um, married to Esther. Uh, three daughters, 13, 12, and actually 15. It keeps changing. 15, 13, and 11 uh, at the moment. So um, lots of homeschooling going on. Uh, very active and extroverted family a lot of the time. So it's been interesting to be in lockdown. But actually, I think it's been, for us as a family, a really good time. We've really had the, the opportunity to be bonded together a lot more and personally I've quite enjoyed a lot of lockdown um, my wife is who is extremely extroverted found it a bit trickier but I think it's been a good time for us overall I'm with your wife on this <laughs> but Ben you, yeah, you mentioned a book to me just before we went on air hold it up for the camera if you yeah. can, and just tell us a little bit about this because it came came to you before COVID, didn't it? The coming revolution in church economics, why tithes and offerings are no longer enough. Sounds attractive. <laughs> uh, who's the publisher, Ben? Can you see it on the back there? Yeah, it's published by Baker Books and it's written by Mark Demaz with Harry Lee, who I believe leads a church called Mosaic okay. in Arkansas. Very good. So tell us a little bit about the books. It obviously impacted you just before COVID hit. Sure. Well, I started looking at that book actually probably four months before the lockdown, simply because um, been thinking any with was thinking anyway about how, as a church, how do we find ways to generate uh, funds and money for the mission of God, which we're so passionate about, um, without being uh, totally dependent on tithes and offerings, which and we we have a very generous church, of course. But um, I'm sure, as I'm sure most church leaders will relate to, and most most churches will relate to, um, we're it's always a faith t journey, and it always will be, of course. But um, we, are there ways, and is there is is there something that we can do to perhaps uh, think more creatively and use the resources that God's given in different ways? Was the question I was wrestling with. So. For us as a church that um, runs a conference center, which is shut down, which means we're really, really not generating some oh, yeah. of the funds that we yeah. are used to. Center. It was quite um, interesting to have 
been already looking at that and be just picking it up again during this season. Yeah. So, Ben, anything particular out of that um, book that's helpful for, for us as we consider post-COVID? Obviously, we're going to hit some economic changes and realities, redundancies. Anything helpful there? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really worth picking up. There's a couple of things that are striking me out of it. One is um, around this idea of co-vocational workers and leaders. Um, yeah. So I think um, now there's a difference between, and um, I'm speaking to the expert, but there's a difference between bivocational and co-vocational. I think the, often the idea for a bivocational worker is that they've got a, a split somehow in what they're doing, but essentially they see themselves as called to the church and they're trying to generate an income to help them do that in, with a tent making mentality, as opposed to people who primarily see themselves with a more holistic call, which has the workplace right at its center and they release themselves to lead as well. So I think um, it certainly got me thinking more about how we can um, think differently about how we employ people into the future. And then the second thing is just around the smart use of resources and how we can how we use buildings and that kind of thing to um, to not purely generate finance, um, but most definitely to generate finance. But with that in mind, um, uh, how we have the benefit of the community in mind as well, not purely a financially driven motive, if you like. So as a as a church that runs a conference center that's interesting are there ways we can do that better we happen to have three buildings can we think more creatively about different ways to use all of them in order to generate finance to release the mission of god more so it's quite well, helpful for you. some of thinking really? about some of those um now i've not done this on an interview before but you touched a particular hot spot for me i i guess folks you can see this letter why i, I bring it up because um Several decades ago, I was wrestling with this notion, which you're now defining for us as bivocational stroke co-vocational. I didn't have those words to frame my dilemma, but my dilemma was I used to see my life as the two arms of a Y, as a business yeah. uh, entrepreneur on the one hand, prophetic Bible teacher, leader on the uh, other hand and I used to pray I used to feel stretched like this top arms of these wise I used to pray God you know just I'd have a great seminar and I say God just let me focus on the business side we could release money to the kingdom I, I could be fulfilled then I'd have a great preach or whatever and I say God just let me follow someone like Bob Mumford or Rob Parsons I'd become a better communicator but I always felt torn this bivocational notion mm. it actually was a tearing thing inside yeah and um i used to pray to god literally used to pray god just let me be one or the other let me be the single rod in the mm. y as it were the stubby bit and i'll never forget it was a life transforming moment just a very few words from a guy called dennis peacock who was preaching at uh, a big celebration knew nothing of my dilemma nothing of what i've articulated to you he walked across to me after he finished preaching pointed at me and said david god says you see a why and it is not so it is a single rod i mention it because i think what you've just said will probably stir something mm -hmm. in a number of people and just to encourage you to think of that co-vocational role i think it's, it's a wonderful uh, notion mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful thing to get us started on so big challenges then with the, the big centre you've got is near the Pride, do you call it the Pride Valley Football Park? What do you call it there? Uh, Pride Park, Pride Park Stadium, yeah. Pride Park Stadium. And I guess that's hemorrhaging cash for you right now in the middle of COVID. So yeah. That's another... yeah. Well, it's a double whammy, isn't it? Because it's not generating the finance that it normally does. And then on top of that, it's still ge it is generating the costs still, yeah. uh, uh, which are offset, praise God, by the, the furlough scheme to some degree. Good. Um, but some are still being generated. So it's a, it, And we do, it, some of our budget is built around our income from that. So it's, a, it's right. an interesting challenge and it, it throws some big questions to us about the future. So talk about that then, Ben. We've tried to talk to a number of folks, including your good friend, co-laborer Mark Mumford, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and other church leaders, Andy Barkley. Well, they're all looking at, well, what does this actually look like when we do finally come out of COVID, whatever that means? I know we're yeah. easing lockdown here in the month of June, but who knows what it's going to look like and for how long. So give us a glimpse into some of the things you've been thinking, maybe anything God's spoken to you as 
an individual or as a leadership team? Sure. Okay. Well, I mean, just to, to start at a deep, at a personal level, and um, my personal journey over the last few years has been very much one of um, trying to dive a lot more deeply into my own internal world, uh, my emotional health, my rhythms, and that kind of thing. Um, so, at a personal level, it really feels like a journey that God's had me on for a while. He's given me an opportunity to go. Okay, it's time to peel a few more layers of the onion off and go to another level. So. The first few weeks of uh, lockdown for us were crazy, um, trying to adjust to a whole new world, working out how we go online and all the rest of it. Um, and then at that point, it really felt like, I felt like God spoke to me personally for myself and for our leaders in particular, but for the church, that um, whilst we had all the instinct in the world to be um, strategizing thinking dreaming about the, what are we going to do next and continue to generate more things he was actually saying as he often does the counterintuitive thing which is to stop slow down uh pause enjoy him and that kind of thing and uh, practice what we preach i mean one of my favorite little throwaway lines is that jesus is building the church and it's my job to get out of the way and to allow him to do it so um We've been doing that. And so actually as a leadership team, we've been, uh, we've been going through a book together for the last little while by Ruth Haley Barton, which is, um, I forget the title now, but the essence of it is how do we hear God and discern as a team, as a community? Um, and what that actually does is push you into, um, first of all, being someone who has good rhythms and things yourself. So um, I think... Um, that being said, then that's something that we re that God's been doing with us. We've been we have slowed down a lot. We haven't generated any new things for a while. The things we did in the last four weeks have seen us through. Uh, they're not diving, and there's some really exciting things happening. As we look to the future, I think we're going to see. Let me some... just stop you there before we go into the yeah. future. Everybody's going to want yeah. to know what these rhythms look like. What are they? Uh, personal rhythms. Yeah. Well, it's really just uh, exploring some some of the things that perhaps charismatics have not particularly um, taken uh, into the modern age. So um, things like uh, the practice of examine, uh, so solitude and silence, a lot more reflection, that kind of thing, um, and then bringing those some of those practices uh, into our, our team to do them as a team as well. So fairly solid spiritual disciplines but perhaps with a, a little bit more of a um tr trying to create the space and the time for rhythms that will, will take us into the future so if there's going to be one new norm hopefully it will be a slower pace of life slow down <laughs> brilliant okay then you were going to take us into the future i think uh yeah so um i think for the future um Again, it's God's often counterintuitive. So I think we're probably wrestling with um, some questions like, is, is God giving us the opportunity to really take note and actually make some radical changes to what we do, uh, which might be informed by some of the stuff we've talked about from the book and thinking about economics, um, but also shape. So I've long been passionate about us being both a gathered and scattered church. And um, I wonder whether the opportunity for us to really embrace um, more fully what it is to be a scattered church might be something that God's giving us an opportunity to do so. So whilst we'll always Church gather and... will understand that, Ben, but maybe not everybody would understand what you mean by that. So can you just unpack that a little bit? Gathered and scattered, yeah. combined, what does that actually mean? Yeah, well, I mean, at its simplest, we see in uh, in the book of Acts, just as the early church is emerging, that they, the people gathered daily in their homes and at the temple gates. And the ho homes was typically an extended family gathering, 30, 40, 50 people. Um, so right now, using technology and that kind of thing, the, uh, the church has really been pushed into those extended family units. And... Um, I just have a sense that we'll have an opportunity not to be missed to push that further and really explore that rather than just running back to the temple as soon as we get the first opportunity. So just to make sure I've understood that accurately, I think what you're saying is 
you're exploring together as a team how you don't lose what's been birthed in COVID, which is this increase in community engagement, community openness. Chris Richards used the phrase helpfully a couple of weeks back. Uh, it's, it's almost as if fences have been taken down, literally, which they have, but also metaphorically, uh, both in terms of outreach, i.e. not yet Christians in the community, but also the Christians in, in the community. I think that's what you're saying, a focus that doesn't miss what God's done there. Absolutely, because yeah. it's uh, that very thing is something that we have been look, building towards for a long time and it, it feels as though COVID's giving us an opportunity to um, slow down in some other areas but accelerate in others and really push taking advantage of the, uh, the natural acceleration of um, community building uh, in and outside the church is, uh, is something that I think we'll really want to embrace. Really interesting because uh, early on in these broadcasts, you're talking like two months back now, uh, I was looking for a singular prophetic sound. That's what I was looking for. And there wasn't one, still isn't, by the way. Uh, but what we did get very early on was Dave Richards and Tony Gray, both in December last year, so 2019, uh, independent of each other, got this same passage, behold, I'm doing a new thing, as it springs forth, do you not perceive it? And what I see right here is exactly that. It's as if God's done the new thing, uh, you know, COVID's come in, we, we've got no choice about it. And what you've done as a team, I think, is try to find the mind of Christ, as you articulated it just now. What is God saying to us out of this that we need to change? Uh, maybe do some things less, some things more. And already then you're perceiving, I think, that God is allowing and nurturing, fertilizing, encouraging this focus on the small community element that integrated. Brilliant. So, okay, do you know yet any ways in which you're going to try and shape that or facilitate it or encourage it? Um, well, we're, we're blessed in that we've been building towards that sort of thing for a while. So we have, um, we have a quite a good structure of coaching for all the leaders of the groups that we already have. But one thing that I think has really quite encouraged me, uh, has been, because another thing I should say is we have quite a, quite a, um, strong vision for planting new things and uh, new expressions. And um, we've got two things lined up already, one into into Malaga in Spain, actually, another into North Africa. So we're experimenting with all kinds of things. But the technology has been a, an incredible blessing. I, I think we would all get fed up pretty quickly with uh, sitting in our lounges every Sunday as an expression of the gathered church, if that was forever in a day. But we've we've discovered that the unifying nature of technology and how it actually easy and accessible it is to do coaching and training and that kind of thing means that to actually plant new expressions new communities that are perhaps a little bit more distant but still be able to give them an a sense of belonging and be some good solid input and care um just seems all suddenly a lot more doable and achievable and the way people respond to technology has really encouraged us. So I, I'd say we've got a, a greater sense of unity and oneness than we probably have had in the last 10 years as a result of this being a church it's in more than one location. Oh, interesting. So in Derby, Belper, Leicester and Nottingham, are you suggesting the online thing has somehow enabled you to connect more than you would have done otherwise? At 100%. It's just been phenomenal, really, because we what we the way we've done it is we've done it as one. So we've consistently had faces from all of the locations speaking as one um we've had a rhythm where a couple of sundays a week it's united as one and then um the other couple of weeks some of the smaller settings have been there for half of it the worship time and then they've broken out into zoom groups but the sense of oneness has been really powerful actually it's been a, it's been quite beautiful that, that's brilliant i'm just going to pause there and then i'm going to get you to pray particularly into this notion of not missing what COVID has loosed in terms of community re-engagement, that 
mm. kindness that's actually also permeated the country for a while, unexpectedly, I, I guess. But I think what you've said so far then is this notion, all right, we want to find the mind of Christ together as a leadership team. You'd already been reading a book that was helping you do that. And as one of those things already perceiving what God might have been doing, you're talking about nurturing, facilitating, encouraging, focusing on these small groups. Uh, and you mentioned the Acts scripture where they met daily from house to house, breaking bread and so on. So that's one thing. And then you've talked about the technology that COVID has forced on us. You, and we're all familiar now with the stats, 15,000 uh, Sunday gatherings in the UK alone online, 24% of the UK now going to church online on Sundays, whereas the norm outside of COVID is 5%. So we've, we've all seen these big paradigm shifts, whether they last or not, of course, is, is another matter. But what you've seen is that same technology which is almost being forced on us has allowed you to consider more creative things with Malaga, North Africa, and other plantings, and also has enabled you to find a, a new level of unity in your churches, in your instance, Derby, Belper, Leicester, and Nottingham. So that's three really quite profound things, positive things that God has shaped in your world uh, through COVID. Ben, before we finish off today's interview, I'm going to get you to pray, particularly for those small groups that meeting together in households daily, and just get you to pray uh, into that as we close out today's interview. Sure. Well, Father, I, I thank you that, um, Lord, whilst you're not the cause of things like COVID, you are a God who works all things together for the good of those who love you. And um, Lord, I want to pray for communities around this nation and beyond that are at this point in time working out what it means to be the people of God without being able to gather, Lord. And um, I pray that you would just bring a, a deep sense of peace, Lord, and comfort in the very fact, Lord, that the way your early church established itself and began, began to grow was through smaller communities, finding family, finding belonging, finding an opportunity to love you together, to love one another together and to love their neighbours together, Lord. And uh, right now, Lord, you are increasing, not decreasing, the opportunities for that to happen. So I pray that you would give creativity and encouragement to different leaders around the nation different households. I pray that you'd encourage people to not give up on meeting together in creative ways, Lord, and that you would begin to really, really, uh, Lord, fuel an extension of your kingdom through smaller gatherings in this time, Lord, and that what, whatever is birthed in this season, Lord, I pray that it won't be lost as lockdown eases, Lord, but it will be, uh, it will, it will be something uh, that really is a new thing that you're doing which changes this nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.